welcome to Book Circle Presents. This time we're going to continue our reading of The Cavalry Cycle. In the cavalry of Grand Normandy, the centaurs that compose it are created by transforming ordinary men. What's that like for the men? First night in barracks. René Wardley, Rennie to friends and family, lay on the mat in his stall and stared at the clock. 2 a.m. Exactly 19 hours ago, he had been shot and changed. He had expected to be surprised, confused, bewildered, disoriented. He had hoped to be healthy afterwards. All that had come true. He had not expected to be sleepless. He was in the military now, specifically the cavalry, most particularly the dedicated cavalry. Oh, dedicated. Being military, they liked to be exact. He had noticed, in the feverish way you notice things in states of high excitement, that it was exactly 7 a.m. when he and the other five guys had been let out of the locker room, leaving behind the clothes that would never fit again. He had taken three last desperate gasps on his inhaler, then tossed it into the trash. Adrenaline would take him from here. Outside was the grassy field where they stood naked in the morning sun in a proper military line. A monster had paced down the line and shot them, one by one, with bow and arrow. Rennie had been the first. This was all according to plan. The monster was a kind-seeming old gent, halfway at least, the bottom half being a light brown horse. His captain, Captain Philip Fletcher, to be his commander, teacher, and guide, but first to shoot him in the chest. Soldiers had to be brave. Rennie had thought about this in terms of the missions he would be sent on. He had not thought about needing bravery to face Fletcher's dispassionate gaze at the other end of the arrow. Thump. He fell, not even hurting yet. He remembered the touch of grass, the glare of sunlight, and then he had no time for anything outside his skin. Not that he could understand what was happening inside his skin. He had no words for the feelings, not then, not now, not ever. There are no holding places in your mind, he remembered, either then or later, from some book he had read. He could say he felt he was growing bigger, that he was growing limbs, but what do those things feel like? No words. No pain, either, and no suffocation. That was the first thing he noticed. He took a deep breath. It went on a long time and felt perfect. He let that first perfect breath out with a laugh. Some corner of his mind noticed his laugh sounded different, but that was nothing. He started the second breath, and while it went on and on, he opened his eyes or maybe just started paying attention to his sight. An arm lay on the grass. From the angle, it had to be his arm, but it was definitely too thick, might be too long, and was also too pink. Well, when you finally get enough oxygen under your skin, he lay on his back, and he lay on his side somewhere. That was confusing. And his waist was uncomfortably twisted. He thought he knew why. How to get up? He pushed himself up on one elbow, but that didn't seem to get him very far, except to give him a glimpse down a vast, shiny black something beyond his waist. Maybe this new body knew how to do it. Just think, get up, and not about how. Thrashing, flailing black legs in the corner of his vision, lying on his back in the grass, and somehow lying on his back in the grass again. OK, think, roll over and get up on three. One, two, three. It worked. He was standing twice. Ignore that for now. But he must have miscalculated because he was staring down at that Palomino fellow with the comic mustache who was seven feet if he was an inch. Was he accidentally rearing? He looked down. The chest to match the arms, good, and belly, and the next chest, glossy black, and his legs, f four legs, not rearing. He was just that tall. Since he had started the survey, he twisted neck and waist to see what was behind him. 
No, not behind him, part of him. He had never had occasion to ride a big black draft horse. Now he would be spending the rest of his life doing so, in a manner of speaking. How far back was his... Oh, yeah. He had thought about this beforehand. He tried a couple of things that only produced a swaying of his hips, but at least he could feel that there was something back there. Come on, wag, wave. Next moment, he learned how to switch his tail. And that booming noise must be his laughter. The next couple of minutes, he spent picking feet up and putting them down while trying to bend over and watch. While his attention returned to things other than his own body, he saw the Palomino officer gazing up at him with amused curiosity from a few feet away. He tried to take his first steps to say, reporting for duty, sir, or something like that, or maybe just thank you. Let's see, front left, rear right, but not exactly at the same time. He teetered over sideways, threw himself the other way, then decided to try for a controlled descent. He got the descent part right. He was now sitting on the grass, his many seeming legs buckled under him. The doctor sauntered over, clearly not worried, a man of respectable height who now seemed short, a study in contrast with lightweight white jacket and spade-cut black beard. The Palomino officer joined him. Heard anything? The doctor asked. No, sir, Rennie answered, his first words with his new lungs. It still sounded like him, mostly. Good. Bones like granite, probably. Excuse me. He moved down the line to where a brown-coated creature was also struggling to rise. It had been a teenage boy a few minutes ago, Rennie thought. Let me give you a hand, said the Palomino, a lieutenant somebody. Not sure that was much help, he added, after Rennie was back on his feet and once more looking down at him. The lieutenant had been able to provide balance, but not much lift compared to Rennie's weight. He held Rennie's hand for a few more seconds, though. Welcome, and congratulations, he pumped the hand. Thank you, sir, Rennie answered, and found he was grinning for no reason. No, he had plenty of reason. The lieutenant moved on to greet others. The captain was circulating, too. Rennie practiced walking and found again that the secret was to not overthink it. Just decide, I'm going over there, and go. Soon, he and the others were wobbling around the field like newborn colts, which was fair enough. He soon established that he was at least a head taller than the others, but like the others, he kept looking back at himself incredulous. You shouldn't see perspective on your own body, should you? I'm a monster, he exclaimed, laughing. We all are, technically, said the lieutenant, appearing at his elbow, but monstrous is as monstrous does, I say. You're getting your feet well. Your families are here. Better say your goodbyes. You'll see them at Christmas if we're still on station here, but not before. Rennie turned. He had to lumber in an arc to do it, and looked toward the field entrance. There were his parents. He waved, but they continued to peer around. Did they know him? Had his face changed, perhaps? Something cold licked his heart. Mom, da, he called, but he knew his voice was different now. Not that different. They zeroed in and approached, astonished. He knew that they, like he, had expected him to look something like Don Quixote united with Rosinante, tall, about this tall, skinny and ramshackle. They stopped a step away and gaped. He sat down again. This time the descent was half controlled. It felt right to be shorter than them just now. He almost was. It worked, he cried, boomed. I can breathe. They both hugged him, past caring about his nakedness. His mother kissed his cheek. He hugged them both at once, heard them wheeze, and backed off. He had never been strong enough to do that to even one of them. The next few minutes were a babble of emotion. He tried to express all his gratitude for all the nursing, the endless wrapping on the back to help him breathe, the hunts for medications, treatments, therapies, diets, exercise regimes, spells, divinations, finally leading here. They expressed over and over, often in repeating phrases, their measureless relief. 
They seemed exhausted with relief. Finally, the three of them just stood, he sat, with arms around each other's shoulders and wept. He breathed easily. It occurred to him that the three of them had bought this luxury at the cost of his humanity, 14 years sworn service, and whatever risks the expeditionary forces sent him into. But the price seemed fair, a bargain. During the orgy of relief, he noticed their eyes roving over him, glimmers of astonishment returning. And maybe there were some gleams of horror, but these were lovingly suppressed. He was their kid, and he was alive. The captain came by and gently told his parents it was time to leave. Some more hugs, a few pictures, his mother even prompted him to strike a strong man pose, and they were gone. He looked around. The other families were trailing out. He had caught glimpses of other meetings during his own. No one had come to meet the new minted Palomino or the paint. They had talked with each other, the doctor, the officers. A mother had just parted company with a tan-coated fellow. Rennie could see, though her son could not, that she wept through a mask of what was definitely horror. A big brown job held hands with his parents, all three looking grave to the point of mourning. What could they have been saying to each other? On the other hand, there was the family of the little red-brown fellow. Little. He was shortest of all the transformees, but still the tallest of his family now. Over six feet? Rennie's ability to estimate height was thrown off by the change in his own. This guy was attended by both parents and a sister, all in cavalry uniforms. Regular cavalry. Standard cavalry, of course, or none of them would have been biped. The parents' uniforms looked old and distinctly tight, so they were probably retired. All four did get teary from time to time, but none stopped grinning. And father and sister often slapped the new recruit on, his sh recruit on his shoulder or his flank in an attaboy kind of way. Only when they turned to go did the mother let herself bawl. And then the officers became brisk and the day became busy. They were taken back to the infirmary through a different, wider, taller door and measured. They were shown all over the training center and most of the neighboring station for the standard cavalry, where the bipedal horse soldiers had sometimes nodded and waved, more often ignored them. There were the mess, the gym, the track, and the barracks. They went to the stables and met the horses and the brownie. In the barracks, they were issued rusty red t-shirts that were their fatigues, thereby making Rennie realize he had spent the whole day naked. Duty jackets and dress jackets would be issued later. Welcome to life after pants. Lectures on routine and discipline, beginning exercises, lectures on upcoming classes. Somewhere in the middle was lunch and later supper in the mess, innocuous food preceded by huge bowls of dark green sludge called mulch that they were ordered to eat. It certainly made the following courses taste better by contrast. Finally, they were sent to bed. They would be roused bright and early, they were told, so it struck Rennie as odd that lights out was rather late. Actually, no one had said to turn the lights out. Their quarters were called barracks, but each of them had a stall. However, each stall had a nameplate outside the entry, a table, a lamp, shelving for books, and mats to sit or lie on, no straw or sawdust in sight. Rennie noticed a cardboard box on the table. In it were the clothes he had put off that morning, laundered and folded. Under them were his wallet, his phone, his class ring, his crucifix, and an arrow. It must be the arrow, he realized, his particular arrow. The shaft was long and wooden. Probably the kind of wood was significant. The feathering was bristly hair. Horse hair? Most likely and the tip itself was something dark and almost stony. Hoof pairing? Did hooves get paired? He would learn. He pulled open the collar of his t-shirt and looked at the red spot on his chest. He had been told that would soon pale to near invisibility. The magic must be spent, but if he was allowed to keep the arrow as a souvenir, he would do so. Not that he would really need a reminder. 
A note in the box told him to take out what he wanted. Anything left would be sent back to his home address or to the address he designated. Fill in the space below. He left the clothes and removed the rest. The chain of the crucifix still fit, though the cross now lay near his clavicle, not over his sternum. He kissed it before putting it on. He was Grand Norman. How to use magic with religious propriety was not an issue. He could be grateful for life-saving magic in the same way he was grateful for a new, improved medication, only more so. And he was grateful. He resolved to say so at least once a day, forevermore. He moved out into the corridor, pleased to note he was staggering less. The others were already there or seated in the entries of their stalls. Now they had the chance to talk to each other, and since no one had really said lights out, they did. They started by learning each other's names and hometowns. All were from the English side of Grand Normandy, though scattered about. They talked about places they had been and wondered, one, if they would ever get back to the unsundered ones, considering the obvious, and two, where they would go as expeditionaries, both fruitless speculations. The teenage boy, Colt, from the cavalry family was named Daniel Bryce and told them their, the names of their coat patterns. Rennie knew Palomino and paint already, and of course he himself was plain black. Danny, red-brown, was chestnut. The tan fellow with dark hair and tail and legs was a buckskin. The biggish guy, brown, with darker hair and tail was a bay. And Captain, F Captain Fletcher was a dun. Almost a buckskin, but with a dark stripe down his back. The paint was Julian, was Julian Carlin and gave out nicknames. Rennie found he was now horsepower, which was startling and flattering after a lifetime of being feeble and gaunt. The bay, Charles Darnley, was Charlie Horse, which was inevitable when you thought about it. Darnley seemed resigned to it. They speculated about the causes of their coat patterns. Carlin seemed puzzled and not very happy about being a paint, but accepted the nickname Mr. Paint from Danny, equitably. Some of them related their reasons for enlisting. Rennie explained about his cystic fibrosis, feeling its absence as a miracle all over again. Danny said his family had been in both cavalries since the start. John Weldon, the buckskin, buckjack, but not very pleased with it, just said he wanted to travel. Rennie wondered if Weldon could possibly want to travel as much as he himself had wanted to breathe since each had paid the same price. Paul Fells, the Palomino, movie star handsome and so far unnicknamed, offered nothing. Neither did Darnley or Mr. Paint. Surely he should be getting to bed? But he did not feel sleepy. It had, after all, been nothing like an ordinary day. He decided to explore the barracks, which should not take long. He left the others trading tales they had heard about expeditions and found at the far end the entry to the showers. It was floored with concrete, not tile. Between the entry and the showers proper was a row of sinks set higher than for, for humans. And how strange to no longer class himself there. And a strip of mirrors. Whoa. As they'd been led around the center, whatever the ostensible topic of the lecture or tour, the real subject of the day had been their new bodies, walking on four tiptoe legs in four-four time instead of heel-toe in two-two time, sitting down with minimum impact, getting up or trying to and then trying again, the feel of being so much more massive. Someday it would surely fade into the background, but today it was front and center. Rennie knew it was that way for the others, too. Whenever they stopped and stood, people, people? Yes, damn it, people. People would lift one leg at a time and flex experimentally or stare at a hoof or look over their shoulders at the new second torso to be called a barrel. Tomorrow he would start learning what to call the parts of his own body in Chenelais, English, and French. Or, Rennie's favorite, wag their new tails. But it had all been about feel, all the inside news from the body. There were occasional and disconcerting glimpses of his body and the new height, but mostly it was feel. Now he looked in the mirrors and saw himself.
No wonder his parents had had a hard time picking him out. His face had not changed, but everything else had. No, even his face had filled out. A full ton and eight feet tall, the doctor had said at the way in a glossy black mass with his torso erupting from it. He knew it was his torso, but it didn't look much like it. He tried the strongman pose his mother had had him strike. Grotesque. Was she really going to circulate that picture? Had he felt a seam give in the t-shirt? Whoa! He hastily dropped the pose. It was Danny, the boy from the cavalry family. But he wasn't looking at Rennie. He was looking at his own reflection. His self-absorption made Rennie smile. Whatever else they might be, he felt sure they were all still human. Danny turned and posed, not strongman style, but trying to get a look at himself from the side. He seemed very pleased with what he saw. He gave a happy little buck and nearly collapsed. Rennie was conscious of some envy. Danny looked like a spirit of spring, even to the youthful awkwardness. He looked back at his own reflection. I am a monster, he muttered, then realized he'd said it out loud. No, you're not, Danny contradicted cheerfully. You look great. And it occurred to Rennie that the smallest foal in the herd might envy the biggest a bit, in which case this was a generous contradiction. He glared at himself in the mirror. The result was a little alarming, but he was thinking, I'm not going to let a bit of vanity kill my new happiness. Step back. Look at the big picture. Didn't you always dream of muscles? They don't look bad, just unfamiliar. It's not like you lost any good looks you used to have. No, wait, he said aloud. I've got this. I was scary before. Do you remember a tall, skinny guy this morning? Not really, Danny admitted. Rennie nodded. They'd each concentrated on themselves, naturally. That was me. I looked like death warmed over, like the Grim Reaper's understudy. You learn not to be scary when you look like that. You smile a lot. Be extra polite. Don't yell unless you really mean it. This is just a different style of scary. I can work around it. Danny waved the issue away. You're not scary. Rennie raised his eyebrows and then loomed just a little in rebuttal. You could be if you wanted, Danny admitted, but don't worry. I've worked with horses all my life. They're not scary just because they're big. The biggest are usually the marshmallows. Rennie smiled. Smile a lot. I think I'm having my chain yanked. You mean your reins? Hey, guys, come see yourselves. In the clatter of hooves and a chatter of voices, the other four came in. Normally, six horse-sized creatures would crowd a bathroom, but this one was built to cavalry spec, and the barracks had been designed to accommodate up to ten. He watched their reactions with interest. It was one thing to know roughly that you must now look what you must now look like, and another to see it. Only Danny had been simply pleased with his new appearance. Fels looked worried, though what the Palomino could have to worry about when he was flat out beautiful, Rennie could not guess. Carlin, Mr. Paint, seemed sheerly curious, neither pleased nor displeased, but evaluating. He had big ruddy patches on a white ground. It was work to take it all in. He kept turning from side to side, which was hard now that he could no longer pivot on a heel, and once reared slightly with his head turned over his shoulder to see his equine back in the mirror. Pretty jazzy, he said at last in his sharp Londonish accent, and seemed satisfied. Darnley and Weldon registered some worry, but more curiosity, and were soon trying out different angles. I feel like I'm trying on a new hat, Darnley muttered, his embarrassment plain on his face, but his gaze still fixed in the mirror. I should ask if it makes my face look fat. Danny laughed. It's okay. Captain Fletcher said our first job was to get used to ourselves. Had he? Fletcher had said a lot of things today. Fells looked into the shower stall. It was large enough for a car wash. Maybe a hot shower would help me sleep, he said. Anyone else? He took off his t-shirt, paced in, and turned to Val. Do they have hot water? Weldon asked. I mean, would you use it on a horse? They had hot water. Fells' shower started to steam. He stood under it, eyes closed, apparently trying to lose himself in it. Carlin laughed. Sure, keep clean. Don't live like animals. No one else laughed. But one by one, they doffed shirts and entered. Briefly, Rennie remembered other group showers. 
exercise was a big part of his life of therapy, which sometimes entailed showers with other boys. Most were polite or polite-ish, but had still stared at his near skeletal frame or had even edged away in case he was catching. Well, that wouldn't happen here. Anyway, he'd already spent most of the day walking around naked with these guys, in public. He peeled off the t-shirt, definite faint tearing sounds, and entered. He didn't need steamy hot air now, but it had pleasant associations. The water itself, though, was new to him now. It pelted all over the new body on stretches of hide he had not possessed this morning, trickling down new legs. The water renewed the strangeness of all these sensations. He felt freshly formed, as he was. It was exhilarating. Fells had the right idea. Rennie gave himself up to it. Sometime later, long or short, he was roused by clopping. He opened his eyes and looked around. Fells was still motionless. Weldon was slowly turning about under his shower. Danny and Carlin were doing the same a bit faster, but Darnley was stumbling through tight figure eights making the clopping. He reached out and turned off his shower. That's enough, plenty, he announced and stumbled out of the shower. His flanks shivered and trembled. That was a normal horse thing, right? And he couldn't remember having done it. Where are the towels, he heard Darnley call. He decided that pleasant as the shower was, he was about as clean and refreshed as he was going to get, so he turned it off and followed Darnley. Fells did the same. That's very focusing, the Palomino said to Rennie, but not relaxing, not tonight anyway. Rennie nodded. What were you focusing on? Fells took a deep breath and answered, everything new, all the new stuff. That was a lot to focus on, and Rennie said so. Fells nodded. Darnley clopped around the corner with an armload of white towels. He passed two to Fells and Rennie. Is this normal, he asked, looking worried and pointing with a thumb back to his flanks, which still trembled. Just then, the warm air of the showers gave out around Rennie, and he felt yet another completely new sensation. It was in his left flank. He glanced back and saw it shivering. I sure hope it's normal, he laughed. Fells nodded and said, it is. And we'll continue to follow Rennie through his first day next time.